We come to another speaker, and this one should make you nervous, because when I was talking to Dr. Very earlier, he said, I'm going to be talking about the conversations in your brain. Do we all have those? I think I, should, I, I could be locked up for some of the conversations I have. And he also mentioned that it would be something to do uh, with our own self-deceptions. So Dr. Eric Very is a, an MD, PhD, and he's in the, uh, a physician in the Department of Neurosciences at UCSD. And I think you'll find that the next 18 minutes will be very, very interesting and stimulating. So please help me welcome Dr. Very. Well, you've per persisted all through this afternoon to listen uh, to our discussions here. Uh, so I'm going to tr try and keep it a little bit lively and make you think and maybe in include a little bit of audience participation. Um, this is a picture that I use to keep myself a little bit humble as a brain scientist. This image is of, a, of two black holes at the center of a galaxy, basically on the other side of the universe. And this is the instrument that was used to find it, the very large array in New Mexico. This thing is so far away that the angular separation between those, those, those two sources is essentially infinitesimal, and yet they were able to find them and its specific radio signature. And yet I cannot go this far into your brain and find the same sources, but we're trying. So I feel a little funny today because I'd like to have a positive message, but I'm going to be talking a little bit about self-deception and deception. And uh, the theme for today is changing the world in a positive direction. And what I really would hope is that maybe we could be a little less stupid. As Bertel Breck said, why should we still want to be so clever when at long last we'd have a chance to be a little less stupid? And my, um, uh, my inspiration here is David Brin, and I'm just waiting for him to come in the door to tell the story about uncertainty. I've had great privilege to meet some of the, the preeminent uh, science and science fiction writers in, um, of the 20th century. I've met Arthur C. Clarke. I was able to take Stephen Hawking into weightlessness. But one of the most profound experiences that I've had which is one that I cannot explain scientifically, is my first meeting in person with David Brin. I, and I only have 18 minutes, but I gotta tell you this story. I was talking to him on the phone, I've been desperately trying to get to meet him, and as somebody suggested earlier this afternoon, if you suggest something to David, he says, oh, I, I wrote that about 20 years ago. And so of course I was talking about some of my technology, he said, of course, I wrote about that about 20 years ago in this book, you should go get it. And so I did. About two weeks later, I was scheduled to go on a flight to San Francisco to give a talk. And what happened was that the travel arrangements were messed up and I got to the flight counter and they didn't have a ticket. And so I was deciding, well, I take this one or go to the other airline. And I went back and forth. And finally, I ended up on an airplane that I was not supposed to be on. In my backpack was the book that I was instructed to buy and read about. Who was on the airplane that I got on that day? <laughs> David Brin. I have never met an author in public anywhere. And yet, he was on the same airplane, in fact, with another speaker today, Sheldon Brown. I can't explain that. I can't explain statistically how that could happen. And in fact, what I've been looking for are all the funny little coincidences that happen in our lives. Now, I've had many of the things, you know, you dreamed that your mother was in a car crash and it never happened and all this kind of stuff. But there's a lot of weird things that science can't explain so my topic today is uncertainty. So let's talk a little bit about technology that's enabling the kind of work that I'm doing. Now, ironically, um, on the right side of the picture here is old technology. It's the ability to record signals from the brain 
that exactly specify, exactly specify activities of the body. We don't have to invoke the genome or the proteome or the connectome or anything. We can literally measure signals that mathematically specify things, which in my case is, I'm, I'm interested in is in eye movements. We can measure these things, but we have to do it in experimental conditions. We can't yet do it in a human. Now, who here has been in the big sewer pipe, the MRI scanner? I've been in, oh yeah, so yeah, there's a good majority of the audience. I've been there 20 or 30 times, I've been a research subject on fMRI. Um, fMRI is measurement of changes in brain blood flow when mental activity or brain activity is going on. So what is fMRI kind of like? Well, it's like a computer chip and you put your thumb on you put your thumb on a spot on the computer chip and it's hot. Something interesting is going on there. We don't know what's going on in the computer chip, but something good is going on. Now, the technology that I have been working with for the last few years is something called high density EEG. We use we measure the electrical activity around the head with these specially designed systems. This is research technology, not something available in clinics at this point. What it does is give us better looks at the electrical activity. Now, it doesn't tell us these specific signals that were started in the 1950s and 60s, allowing us to record the brain activity in experimental situations, but it's getting better. And importantly, a technology has been developed to help us extract the useful information from these electrical recordings. And in fact, one, a very important technology along this way has been developed here at UCSD and at the Salk Institute, software that deconvolves, helps us find the interesting electrical sources in the brain. This is getting closer. So it's not just putting on the thumb on the hot part of the brain and say something's good is going on. We're getting closer to the signals that we are interested in. So let's talk about self-deception and our own mental models. And uh, there's a great routine by Bill Cosby where he talks about the mind and the body. And he says the mind is really egotistical. And it's probably a survival thing, but the mind really is egotistical. But you know you've made a lot of mistakes. So he, audience participation part here. Next Wednesday, you were supposed to have an appointment with me to come and get a million dollars. Next Wednesday, you're going to come and get a million dollars in my office. My office calls you up and says, your appointment has been moved forward two days. Now, who is confident of which day you're going to come to see me next week? Who's confident? A few hands, some hands going up. Who's confident? Your appointment is moved forward two days. Now, who confidently says Friday? Who confidently says Monday? About half and half, typical for an audience like this. The whole point is that we have different mental models. And so we, while we are confident in our own mental model, we can't we should not necessarily assume that that means that we know what somebody else's mental model is. The paradigm I'm talking about is something called egocentric versus allocentric navigation. It has to do whether you feel like you are moving through time, moving forward, or is time moving towards you, moving forward this way. I say moving towards me, that's why I think it's Monday. So when the, when the doctor's office calls, make sure you get what day it is. This is not just a theoretical problem. These are, these are images of flight instruments from Russian aircraft and American aircraft. Turns out that the American aircraft are actually designed from an egocentric point of view, as if the, the instrument is flying through the uh, environment. In contrast, the Russian aircraft are designed the opposite way. It shows you what the environment is and how you are moving through it. Two different things. And in fact, this led to a recent aircraft tragedy in Russia where an experienced 10,000-hour Russian pilot 
was flying an American airplane with American instruments and had to trust them and reverted back to his Russian training. So these mental models are important and we have to understand um, what is the difference between the two, what somebody else may be designing for you. But even more important, we were going to talk about self-deception. And a guy, a Harvard memory researcher named Schachter came up with this protocol where it was about memory of words. And we adapted it for a navigation problem. And so I call this experiment the why the husband doesn't stop at the gas station and ask for directions experiment. What happens is you sit and you see this virtual scene on a computer and the scene starts to move. It rotates and translates and then suddenly stops and asks you which direction you are facing. Now the subjects are instructed. Sometimes this scene will move so fast you will not be able to keep up. And in fact, we program the computer to do that. If you get good, we make it go faster. So we instruct subjects to say, if you are not sure which way you are going, if you are not sure, push the button that says lost. Now when I designed this thing, I, I was thinking I wanted to have a big button that said lost in big red letters. You loser, you put the lost button. <laughs> but I didn't have to do that. Um, we made it real simple. If you were anywhere near close in the right direction, we gave it to you. And in fact, what we did was design the experiment so that you were correct about 60 to 70 percent of the time. So what that meant is about 30 to 40 percent of the time, you were wrong. Now, if you were confident, you would push the last button. But in fact, we, people did what we expected both men and women, I have to confess, ladies, that they pushed the button of a direction even though they were wrong. We said, push it if you're confident, and they confidently pushed the wrong button. <laughs> Two important things came out of that. One is that we could tell, just by measuring how long it took you to push the button, whether you were correct or not. If you were correct, you push the button correctly. If you were unconfident, or if you, if you push the button, we're wrong, there's a debate going on. This is the conversation in your brain, and this is the problem by being forced to give a dichotomous choice, lost or not, left or right. If we are forced into the straitjacket, then we, we, we choose something, and it takes a little time. And importantly, we could see this in our brain monitoring technology. So not only we measured how fast you responded, but we measured the electrical signals coming off of your brain as you did these things. And using our advanced software analysis, we were able to compare the responses between the correct button press and the incorrect button presses, not the last button, but the incorrect button presses, and found substantial differences even before you push the button. There were substantial measurable changes in brain activity in certain areas that were related to the button press. These areas, there were two areas of interest. One is in the high back part of the brain. This is where information about movement is integrated. It's from the sensation of your body, from the sensation of your ears, from visual information. It's all put together back up here. And we found this significant differences in this integration. So what we are really looking for is a signal that says you're lost, you're disoriented, whether you admit it or not. Furthermore, we saw activity up in the front of the brain, the more, the more decision-making part of the brain, and this ties into this timing thing, and I think what it really suggests is that this voting thing, we're forcing you to make a choice, comes in. So the voting is happening up in the front, the integration is happening in behind. So ultimately, what I want to do is create a technology that gives you feedback. Right now, if we train a pilot um, or we train a trader on Wall Street, we make them do something and then we wait and see what happens. And if they have lost awareness of the situation or situation awareness, SA, we don't know until it's too late. In other words, until the plane is so far off course that it's too late to recover. 
And so what I would look, what I hope to create um, with these kinds of technologies is a monitor detecting in the brain whether you are oriented to the task or not. So that when we become disoriented, the, the computer comes up and gives you a dope slap and says, hey dude, look where you're going. You're not paying attention. When it, and it'll do that before you deviate off course to get you back on course. Imagine if they had that in Wall Street about three years ago. So the whole point, it's like the dog. You gotta bop him on the nose fast enough after he pees on the carpet so he knows what he has done wrong. If you wait too long, then the feedback doesn't work. Now there's actually a technology that's coming on the environment, uh, on the, in the, uh, coming out from Philips called the Rationalizer. It's a little wrist device. It measures stress. We hope that we'll be, by adding these more sensors and more sophisticated brain analysis, that we'll be able to be more accurate in the detection, not just of stress, but really the, uh, the state of being oriented, being aware or not. So we have some issues that's still not uh, out there for prime time yet. We have to be able to measure all this electrical activity and do these computations in real time. It's coming. Also, our brain changes from day to day. This is a serious problem. However, if we, get, if we are able to localize these sources to the things like the specific navigation part of the brain, rather than signals that are referring to whether you're awake or not, we should be able to get away from that. Remember, your eye movement control is the same. The eye movement signals are the same until you change your glasses. So they go on for hours and hours and days and days the same signals going on. We need wearable technology. This is coming as well. Here in San Diego, there are several groups working on wearable technology for these kinds of signal detection. So what's next? What I really want to do when I, when I grow up is to create tools to help us think better. And so going beyond just this thing of detecting whether you're oriented to a problem, whether you are uh, making a mistake or not, I want to go to something about uh, more profound things, like meaning. In fact, we have now done this. We've been able to detect electrical signals in the brain related to the meaning of something that you are trying to say or something you are thinking about. We're not reading your thoughts. It requires you to cooperate in this experiment, but the signal that's related to the meaning of something like the sound too whether it is the number two or the pronoun two, is actually accessible and measurable electrically. So we can do, so ultimately we'll have a speech recognition system that is not just based purely on statistics of speech, but the intended meaning of what you were trying to say. Our signal recording system will detect that intended meaning. And ultimately I hope we'll be able to create tools that will help us design environments, do mathematical computations, put the meaning of what we want on paper, and so those, those are the tools for the future. And so uh, some days I think I should have just gone and uh, been an eye surgeon or something like that. Uh, why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill and go into this area of neuroscience, which is so incredibly frigging complicated, but it's a whole lot of fun and we get to do some neat experiments. Thank you very much.